Just want to say that I'm not perfect, so it's possible that there are mistakes in this video. Uh, if there are, I will be leaving them in a pinned comment below, so make sure to read that after you're done watching the video. Thank you. As far as shooters go, Splatoon is pretty unique for a lot of reasons. I mean, what other game lets you play as both a kid and a squid? Foam stars? <laughs> Get that out of here. But one of the most interesting unique aspects of Splatoon is how it handles what comes out of its weapons. Many shooter games make use of what is known as hitscan, where upon firing your weapon, the game traces a line from where the bullet originates to the crosshair, and if that line happens to intersect a target, it will deal damage. Splatoon, however, has absolutely no hitscan weapons, instead using exclusively projectiles where the bullets actually move in real time. Despite the ubiquity of projectiles in Splatoon, most people don't really understand how they work. So that's what I'm here for. Over the course of the next few videos, I will explain loads of details on how the game handles projectiles from all sorts of different weapons, main, sub, and special. There's going to be a lot of math and dense explanations, but don't worry, I've prepared a ton of 2D and 3D animations to showcase what the projectiles look like in practice, so if you don't care that much for the technical explanations, you can always just watch the animations. This first video is going to be a dissection of some of the universal mechanics that apply to a significant amount of weapons across Splatoon 3. Because of how common these mechanics are across weapons, it's important to go over them in their own videos so later videos will make more sense. Firstly, I need to explain the scale of things though. I'm going to be using the term distance unit, or just unit, a lot in this series. Distance units are an arbitrary unit that the game uses to calculate distance. The Japanese community frequently refers to them as meters, which is a good way of thinking about them. They're basically just meters in the Splatoon world. So how large are these distance units exactly? In Splatoon 3, the dash lines in the testing range are exactly 5 units apart. Players also have a capsule-shaped hitbox with a radius of 0.35 units and a total height of 1.65 units. The swim form hurtbox is also spherical with a radius of 0.8 units. It does not appear to change while submerged in ink. I'm not 100% sure of this estimate either. I couldn't confirm directly if this is true or not, so empirical testing had to suffice, and this is pretty much the best I got. Also, you know those block objects that appear across a ton of maps? Those have a base size of 1.5 by 1.5 by 1.5 units. Those of you familiar with Splatoon 1 or 2 distance units, but not Splatoon 3 distance units, may be confused by these numbers. That's because in the transition between Splatoon 2 and 3, the size of a distance unit was multiplied by 10. Thus, distance units in Splatoon 1 and 2 are one-tenth the size of Splatoon 3 distance units. With that out of the way, we can now get into the projectiles themselves, starting with what I'll call Bullet Simple. Bullet Simple is a movement pattern that is so common in Splatoon 3 that it's easier to list the things that don't use it over the things that do. Safe to say, this is very important for everything else in the series, so pay close attention here. Firstly, I need to explain the parameters that control the projectiles. Here are all the parameters that control Bullet Simple. The numbers you see here are default values that the game will use for any weapons that do not explicitly define their own values for any of these parameters. Here are the values defined for Splattershot. You'll notice that only four of these parameters are explicitly defined, with one of them being identical to the default value. So for all of the missing parameters, the default values will instead be used, resulting in this lineup of parameters. Observe this player firing the splatter shot and watch the arc that his projectiles take. You may notice that the projectiles start out by moving straight, but begin to fall after a certain point. Let's mark the area in which they go straight with a dotted line. If you're particularly observant, you may notice a second point in which projectiles seem to follow a more consistent path after a short period of slowing down drastically. Let's mark this point with a dotted line as well. What we're seeing here is the three states that a projectile will go through during its lifespan. Straight state, break state, and free state. Let's now move over to a simulation that will help me guide you through the process. Straight state is the most simple. It's a state in which the projectile travels at a constant velocity for a set number of frames defined by these two parameters. So, in the case of the splatter shot, its projectiles spawn at a speed of 2.266 units per frame for 4 frames, covering a total distance of 9.064 units. Once it is the end of straight state, if the projectile is moving above a certain speed, it will be limited to that speed. In this case, the splatter shot has its projectile speed limited to 1.493 units per frame. After this limit in speed, the projectile will then enter break state, in which air resistance and gravity now apply. In this state, the projectile will continue as normal using the weapon's defined air resistance and gravity values as seen in these parameters. As mentioned earlier, the Splattershot's projectiles use the defaults of 0.36 for air resistance and 0.07 for gravity, which translates to a 36% loss of its speed per frame, equivalent to multiplying its velocity by 0.64, and the addition of a downward velocity of 0.07 units per frame per frame. Air resistance is applied first, and gravity is applied second. 
Resuming the simulation, we start by applying the air resistance, taking the X velocity down to about 0.96 units per frame, while the Y velocity of 0 is unaffected since 0 times anything is 0. After this, the gravity of 0.07 units per frame per frame is applied, leaving the Y velocity at negative 0.07 units per frame. With these values, we can now move the projectile by these amounts. The next frame, we apply the air resistance again, leaving the X velocity at 0.61 units per frame and the Y velocity at negative 0.045 units per frame. We then add gravity to the Y velocity, leaving it at negative 0.115 units per frame. Hence, the projectile now moves about 0.61 units forwards and 0.115 units downwards, and this process repeats. Free state is the third and final state of a projectile. Free state is entered when a few conditions are met. Firstly, the projectile's Y velocity must be below a certain threshold. By default, this threshold is negative 0.15 units per frame. In addition to this condition being met, the projectile must also meet one of two other conditions. Either its X velocity must be below a certain threshold, or it must be in break state for a certain number of frames. These parameters have default values of 0.2355 and 4 respectively. In general, it is pretty rare for a projectile to meet the X velocity threshold before the frame threshold, usually only happening when a projectile is fired downwards. Once free state is entered, it works pretty much the same as break state, but with different air resistance and gravity values. These values are usually set to be far lower than the air resistance and gravity of break state, hence making free state much more stable as the velocity doesn't change as much. The projectile will continue in the state until it collides with something or the game removes it for being active for too long. Here's a demonstration showing what happens when a projectile is fired upwards instead. Straight state continues as normal, but break state will take far longer to exit because it takes longer for the Y velocity to fall below the required threshold to enter free state. Remember that while only one of these two other conditions must be met to exit break state, we always require the Y velocity condition to be met. Once the Y velocity condition is finally met, you may notice that the X velocity is far lower than it would otherwise be upon exit of break state. Hence, the projectile continues on a complete nosedive. Finally, here's a demonstration of a projectile being fired downward pretty sharply. Please note that I had to adjust the scale to make this work. You can see that after straight state, break state ends a frame earlier because we meet the X velocity condition before the frame condition. This doesn't really mean a whole lot in this case, but it's interesting nonetheless. You can see that the projectile's path is hardly curved at all. Now, these arcs are cool and all, but if you've played a lot of Splatoon, there's probably a few burning questions in your head right now, mainly wondering how damage factors into all of this. You see, the crosshair is placed at a point in the trajectory where your projectiles will do maximum damage, asterisk, and anything after this point suffers damage fall off. So where exactly is this point? It's not actually at the end of straight state, nor at the end of break state. It's at a fixed point a certain number of frames after the projectile spawns. In the case of the spotter shot, this point is 8 frames, which is right here. Here's what it looks like when you fire it at different angles. Here's another demo showcasing how the distance between the spawn point and crosshair changes depending on the firing angle. Shooters can fire upward at up to a 75 degree angle or downwards at up to a negative 70 degree angle, with an actual firing angle of 5 degrees. You can see that because the projectile slows down more when it is fired upwards, the effective range is higher when it is fired at a downward angle. Anyways, after the projectile passes the crosshair, damage will be lost per frame. For the spider shot, it starts at 36 damage at frame 8 and falls off to 18 damage at frame 40. This means that it loses about 0.56 damage per frame, always being rounded down to the nearest tenth. Splatoon 3 doesn't actually internally represent its damage numbers with decimals, instead using integers 10 times the size that you see when hitting the training dummies in-game, so there isn't any hidden damage that's truncated. Next up is projectile size. Every projectile has two different hitboxes, one used for collisions with terrain, and another used for collisions with players and objects. The terrain hitbox is usually less than or equal to the size of the player hitbox, as an overly large terrain hitbox could have issues hitting players next to walls or disappear too quickly after getting too close to the ground. This can come with the side effect of sometimes hitting players that are slightly behind walls, but usually that's a trade worth taking. The hitbox sizes are controlled by the following parameters. 
Like with Bullet Simple, if a weapon doesn't define a parameter on this list, it'll fall back on using the default value seen in the second column. I'll be showing you a simulation that will use the following values for this parameter, so I can explain how they work. When a projectile spawns, it starts off by using the defined initial values for the hitbox sizes. After this, the hitboxes will then independently shift size until they reach their final size values on their defined frames. Looking through the simulation, you may notice that the hitboxes only change their size at the beginning of a frame, before they move, rather than while they are moving. The field hitbox stops changing size on frame 5 of our simulation, but the player radius continues changing until frame 8. Teammate collision initially is disabled, but becomes enabled a certain number of frames after the projectile is fired. For a lot of shooter-type projectiles, this collision is enabled frame 0, so instantly. For blasters, this collision is enabled on frame 1000, which effectively means teammate collision is disabled. If it were to be enabled for blasters, that could allow you to direct your teammates, causing a premature full-size explosion. Alas, no such thing is possible. Projectile deviation is a bit complicated. Here are all the parameters that control projectile deviation alongside their defaults, and with the values defined for splatter shot. I know it looks strange and complicated, but I'll try my best to explain. There are two values that control projectile deviation known as swerve and bias. Swerve is simply the maximum number of degrees that a projectile can deviate from the center. The size of your aiming reticle represents how large your swerve is. Swerve mostly remains the same at all times, but does increase after you jump. The standing swerve and jumping swerve values are stored in these two parameters. Bias is a bit more interesting though. If you play Splatoon a lot, you likely know that the longer you fire your weapon without stopping, the less likely it is for your shots to go straight. This is the bias value at work. The bias is a value that varies from 0 to 1 that basically determines how likely your shots are to deviate at higher angles, with a larger bias resulting in more shots deviating from the center. The game keeps track of two different bias values, one that increases when you fire your weapon, which I'll call grounded bias, and one that increases after you jump, which I'll call jumping bias. When the game picks the angle of deviation for your next shot, it will choose whichever bias value is larger at the time. The shot deviation formula looks like this, and I learned about it from this Japanese player, whose channel I'll leave in the description. N is a random number between 0 and 1, R is randomly either 1 or negative 1, and B is a net bias, which, as mentioned previously, varies between 0 and 1. This formula spits out a number between negative 1 and 1, which is then multiplied by the net swerve to get the angle of deviation. Essentially, this formula returns how much the shot will deviate as a percent of its maximum deviation, with 0 being no deviation, and 1 or negative 1 being maximum deviation. Okay, so originally I was going to do a whole section breaking down exactly how this formula works, but it was boring and most of you probably don't care anyway, so I chucked it out. Instead, I'll simplify it by showing you a bar graph that shows the likelihood of the shots deviating at any particular angle. Each bar represents 5% of the maximum possible degree of deviation, with their height showing how likely it is for any particular shot to deviate within that specific 5% of the maximum angle of deviation. At a bias of zero, the game has a hard-coded exception to ensure that all of your shots go straight with no deviation, regardless of your weapon's swerve. This is because logs don't work properly with zeros, however it does fit the natural behavior pretty well. If we up the bias a bit, we start to see that while most of the shots are concentrated towards the center, there's a small chance that they deviate a significant amount, with there being not much variance between possible deviation angles. You can see that the chance of a deviation between 35% and 40% is only about twice as likely as a deviation between 95% and 100%. As we continue to increase the bias, we see an increase in the chance that shots deviate outwards until we reach a bias of 0.5, at which point there is an equal likelihood that shots deviate at any angle. Under normal circumstances, there is no way to exceed this bias value in-game without modding, but just for fun let's see what happens when we do. Immediately, there is a sharp decline in the number of shots that deviate towards the center. The odds then gradually straighten out, leading to a nice and consistent increase in deviation chance, but then we start to see heavy bias towards the outer deviation angles until we hit a bias of 1 at which point the shots will always deviate at the maximum possible angle. Now that you understand how different bias values affect your accuracy, I can explain how the bias values themselves are calculated, starting with the grounded bias. When you start firing your weapon after a period of not firing for a bit, it will start out with an initial grounded bias value determined by this parameter. The grounded bias is then increased by an amount determined by this parameter every time you fire your weapon, and maxes out at a value equal to this parameter. Then, after you stop firing, your grounded bias will be reduced by an amount determined by this parameter every frame until it returns to its minimum value. Additionally, the grounded bias isn't reduced until you've waited a number of frames since your last shot equal to your weapon's fire rate. In the case of this wider shot, since it fires every 6 frames, you need to wait 6 frames after your last shot in order to recover accuracy. If this check were in place, you could hypothetically recover your accuracy between continuous shots by mashing ZR at a rate equal to your weapon's fire rate. With all of this in mind, let's move over to a simulation which shows the standing bias in real time. The weapon I'll be showing is, of course, the splatter shot, which as a reminder has this lineup of parameters. 
Yep, that's it. Here, I'll show you it again in slow motion so that you can watch it more closely. Alright, with Grounded Bias out of the way, let's talk about what happens when you jump. Right after you jump, the game starts a timer in the background and sets your swerve and jumping bias to these two values respectively. The background timer counts up by 1 per frame if you are in the air, or 2 per frame if you are on the ground. Once the timer reaches a certain value determined by this parameter, the swerve and the jumping bias begin to recover back to their default values until the timer reaches a value determined by this parameter. It is worth noting that Intensify Action only reduces the maximum jumping swerve and does not affect the jumping bias whatsoever. So unless your weapon's grounded swerve is zero, jumping will still incur an accuracy penalty even with maximum Intensify Action equipped. Here's another simulation with a few jumps thrown in as well. When the stand bias text is red, it means that the simulated splatter shot is currently firing. When the jump bias text is red, it means that the simulated splatter shot is currently in the air. The net bias is the value of whichever bias type is larger, denoted by the yellow number. As a quick refresher, here are all the parameters at work here, with their default values and the values defined for splatter shot. And once more in slow motion. Well, that's pretty much all that I want to go over during this first part of the series. The following videos will be mainly focused on class-specific mechanics and demos for each weapon in the game, similar to the ones you saw here, with a few additional videos of universal mechanics sprinkled in here and there. I've spent months creating these demos, and I'm really excited to finally get something substantial from this project out on the internet. I hope you all enjoy what's coming next as much as I enjoyed creating them, and I'll see you soon for the next part.